Good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is Cricket Lot on Wednesday, September 14th, 2022. Tomorrow, my baby turns 44. So <laughs> actually about five and a half hours from now. He was born at 1240 after midnight. So anyway, um, tonight we um, have a lazy teacher who's going to allow somebody else to do the teaching for you because she couldn't find something she could really get fired up about. So we're going to um, we're going to show a video. And I got to find the spot where it says here, share sound. So you can be sure to see, hear them when they're talking. And I was saying before everyone, before I started recording, if you go on YouTube and then type in the search box, YL Drop Podcast, you will get all these different videos on lots of different things. Um, Steve told me about the search for the 13 original oils. And so maybe we'll do that one of these times. I have to admit, Steve, I still haven't watched it yet. Oh, man, it's really, really interesting. The woman okay. is just fascinating. Okay. And actually, well, Cricket, I'm pretty sure there's a Facebook group, Wild Podcast. So you could access yes, it there through is. there too. Yeah. Oh, okay. You can see them through there too. Okay. Facebook um, Wild Drop. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. So YouTube is now full screen. And so can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. We're going to start. Uh -huh. It's hard for me to think of something more beautiful than lavender fields in bloom. Now, I've been around lavender farmland my whole life, but it still takes my breath away to see the ground painted bright purple in contrast to the beautiful blue sky, especially at sunset. And of course, the smell. There's nothing like it. It's no wonder that the lavender fields have inspired works by Monet, Van Gogh, and many, many more. Hello, and welcome to Young Living's podcast, The YL Drop. My name is Jacob Young, your host. This podcast will provide you with drops of information about Young Living, like stories, history, products, lots of little fun facts, and even more. Young Living is the world leader in producing and distributing premium quality essential oils. With that being said, we're also going to give you an opportunity to win this bottle right here. Stay tuned for that. In this episode, we're going to talk about lavender. And we can't have a discussion about lavender that doesn't involve France and its world-famous lavender fields. Joining me today is Jean-Noël Landel, who grew up in Provence region and who has been involved commercially in lavender for over four By the way, it's Provence, not Provence, so. 40 years. Welcome, Jean-Noël, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you, Jacob. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us on The Wild Drop. It's always great to have you here. John Noel have John Noel and I have many, many memories um, shared with my dad, especially. And uh, just want to say thank you once again for coming on. So, um, John Noel, we'd really like you to quickly kind of go over your various experiences as a farmer, distiller, liaison with other farmers, and kind of just how you got into... Uh, farming with lavender, if you'd like to touch up on that a little bit. Oh, it dates back to when I was a very young boy uh, during the vacation at my grandma's house. Uh, there used to be, you know, those little lavender sachets that we put uh, in, to protect the, the uh, clothes from a uh, moth. And I love that smell so much. I used to take one of those sachets and put it under my pillow. And I would sleep with the smell of lavender when I was very, very young. And to me, the connection between the smell of lavender and happiness uh, came up with me. So I always loved lavender smell. So then in 1970, I. To, I, I opened a health food store 
And at that time, in, in the 70s, there was no aromatherapy at all, you know. But we were selling three different essential oils, lavender, eucalyptus, and orange. That's all. And I was so happy to discover essential oils at that time. Then I met with my wife, Jane, in the 80s. Uh, we lived in the US, didn't do anything with lavender at that time. But coming back from the US in 1986, I enjoyed going for vacation or just little trips to the lavender fields in the south of France. And I told Jane, I remember, I want to work here. I love it so much. So I made contacts with different uh, people around and I got a good job to take care of exportation of lavender essential oils for a co-op of a lavender grower. And that's how it started in 1989. I love it. And so with that being said, you have vast knowledge and history about lavender. Um, you've told me that you know the history of lavender from the Egyptians to the Greeks and the Romans. Could you touch up a little bit on that as well? Lavender in Latin, lavare comes, lavandula comes from the notion of lavare, that means to wash up, to, to clean. Because very early, the ancient uh, Romans discovered that by just putting some lavender, even rubbing lavender flowers, would kind of kill the germs, bacteria, and so on. So it has been considered as one of the best way to treat yourself against all kind of disease linked to bacteria or, or, or germs. Uh, the distillation, there are different point of views. You know, some people say uh, alambic. Alambic is the name for a, distil a distiller, you know, and that's that comes from uh, Arabic. So people think that they invented the distillation system. I also know that the Romans used to do some kind of distillation by putting the plants in water. They would boil the water and above the water, they would just put a, like a, a sheet, you know, a drape and the, the steam will go up through the, the cloth. You see what I mean? Excuse my English, but um, it will capture, it will, the, the, the cloth would capture the essential oils and then they would just press the cloth and, and get the liquid that was half water and, and some essential oil in it. That was a form of distillation. Wow. So that was kind That's of it. the early inventions of the gooseneck and the condenser in a way. That's really, really impressive. Yeah. Wow. So with you knowing all this vast knowledge about lavender and coming into the world of lavender, can you talk a little bit about how lavender was used uh, in the early years of France with the, the perfume? And you said that... Uh, there was a comment that you made a while back when we did our Zoom call to begin with, something about the stinky French lavender that you talked about. Can you can you touch on that as well? <laughs> Jacob, I don't understand what you mean by sticky sticky French. What, what stinky? Oh, stinky. <laughs> okay, I got it. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, in the Middle Age, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have showers or. Uh, it was rare to take bath, you know, but uh, no shower. So people didn't wash up uh, uh, themselves very well. And one way of, as I said before, uh, uh, clean yourself was the use of perfumes. And that would also protect, you know, from disease. And in a way, it would be a way of washing yourself. So uh, that's how the first perfumes were in, invented. It, it was in order to, to get rid of, of bacteria and, and bad smell. Yeah. And it was very common. That was you know, around the Middle Age that it started to be used for that. You know the story of the four thieves, don't you? Um, 
with um with how they were robbing the graves right okay that was during uh, the, those big plagues you know uh, that that were killing uh, millions of people in the middle age yeah and there were four thieves in the south of france who were able to rob the dead people from the from the very uh, deadly disease without catching the, the the sickness ever so once the authorities cut uh, uh, cut them they found a way to give them their their recipe mm -hmm. and that was use they were using a vinegar at that time in which they would just let sit many different uh, plants aromatic plants and uh, after that they would put their clothes in it and they would rub their whole body with this mixture and that was a way to protect themselves from catching the plague and that's how they could rob dead people that were very contagious anyway wow. and they would never catch the so that the, it shows really the power of essential oils you know that it does and they robbed them of their jewelry, of their clothes. What did what did they rob off of them exactly? Well, they would they would put their clothes in the, in, in in this liquid, you know, made of vinegar and and aromatic plants, and they would also rub their face, their their arms, their their body, you uh -huh. know, kind of, and that was a way to protect themselves. So. The, I don't say it was a perfume because I did smell <laughs> this mixture. But, uh, and it's not a good smell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a mixture that probably wouldn't smell too good at all. And you're right, it, it does show the true power of the essential oils and just how amazing they are and how they work. So talk to me about how essential oils were brought to Pasadena, California, and you kind of visiting and exploring the essential oil world. Uh, something about meeting this mysterious cowboy who would one day save the lavender industry in France. Uh, it was in 1990. My son Nicolas was six months old. And I, as I told you before, just started to be a distiller myself for about uh, a year. And I decided to go to the U.S. and find out what the situation with essential oils was, you know, I had no idea. We didn't have internet at that time, you know. Yeah. So I had no idea how, if there was a market for it or what was going on about essential oils. So I went to Pasadena to a big health show. It was a professional health show, I remember, with hundreds of uh, booths, you know, people showing their products. So I went there with a few bottles of lavender oil, rosemary, thyme oil, whatever we were distilling in Provence at that time. And I toured, I did a tour of the whole show with no success at all. I mean, nobody knew about essential oils, even yeah. less than in France. But about midday, I saw a very little booth that sat on top of it and that was the only one, aromatherapy essential oils. So I said, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. And that gave me a big smile. So then I met a cowboy there. That was your father, Jack. He was right in front of the booth. And all I did was take a bottle of lavender oil out of my pocket, hand, handed it to him, he opened it, smelled it, and it, he looked at me. I still remember his face with a big smile. Then I knew he was a connoisseur because I knew my product was pure and natural, you know. And he said, well, if you distill that in France, I always wanted to go to France and participate in the cultivation and distillation of, of lavender oil. Can I come and see you? And that was the first contact we had. And I had no idea that one day this cowboy would save the true lavender growers in France. And this is just the amazing part of this whole story we had together. Wonderful. And what a great beginning to our next part of the segment. But before we get there, let's take a quick 60-second break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. 
Welcome to the giveaway where you can win this 15 milliliter bottle of lavender essential oil. All you need to do is go to this YouTube video and comment down below which is your favorite lavender field, whether it be the one in St. Mary's, Idaho, the one in Mona, Utah, or Tuesday on all social media and Instagram at the and kind of touched up on the story of how you met my dad, how you were first introduced to him. What followed after that? You you talked about how my dad wanted to go and visit France and how he wanted to be part of the cultivation and, and learn more there. What followed after meeting my dad in Pasadena? Well, I had um, mixed feelings. <laughs> I thought how a cowboy could be interested in lavender. You know, that was kind of weird to me. And then uh, I had very, a good feeling of confidence that this man was trustworthy. And he said, you know, I always wanted to go to France, but I have a big problem. I don't speak French. I have no connection there. Can I come and visit you? And about uh, six months later, in the middle of winter at 5 p.m., he just landed in Paris, and we were at that time about 10 hours drive from Paris, you know. And he said, how can I get to your place? And I said, well, I will see you tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> and I, I, I learned after that that he rented a little car, and he slept in his car on his way, you know, for a few hours, and just arrived the next morning as soon as he could. Uh, because he was in a hurry to meet with Lavender and and myself uh, and the distillation. So after driving through the night and spending a few hours in his car, when he finally arrived, what all did my dad learn? What did you teach him? What was the process through all of that? Uh, when Gary arrived, he was mostly interested in the techniques of farming and the techniques of distilling. But you can imagine we had very long conversation about essential oils and lavender every night. Uh, and I, what I discovered already at that time, he had much more knowledge on essential oils, what we could do with essential oils than what we had in France. And that was kind of impressive. It was so astonishing for us. You know, for example, lavender has different properties. Mostly one of them is to calm down by just, you know, breathing it. And we didn't know that in France. We were, uh, the, 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 the French doctors who were prescribing lavender were only prescribing it as a way to treat uh, minor cuts or wounds, you know, burns, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's all. But Gary was bringing a, what I would call a psychological or even spiritual uh, use of essential oil that we had no idea about. So that was very, very interesting. All my, my friends, like Marcel, who was my my teacher as a distiller, uh, would come over, you know, uh, very often just to listen about what Gary knew about it. But in terms of cultivation, farming, he had some very good basic knowledge, you know, but he could learn a lot from the French growers that had been distilling for almost a hundred years. So he, he was very happy to share because that's how I would consider your dad. You know, he was always sharing his information and he would use other people's information. And uh, that's important in life. Yes, that it is. He always made sure to acquire as much knowledge as he possibly could. So with being there and learning all the cultivation, the distillation and the techniques, can you talk a little bit about the farm that is there in France that we currently have? Yeah, that happened uh, uh, many years after the first meeting, of course. I think it happened in uh, 2002, because since the beginning, Gary told me we need to find a farm so we could farm our own lavender in France. But that was very difficult to find land uh, for, for farming. So it took us about 10 years to find uh, the, the, the right place. 
uh, the idea uh, of Gary was to control the quality of the oil because as I mentioned before at that time essential oils were mostly used for perfume industry and there was a lot of cheating on quality of the oils they would you know mix the oil with other synthetic products and to Gary it was like a crime and he said if we have difficulties to find genuine pure essential oils we have to control the production of it so we found a farm in 2002 and uh, we started cultivation and most of all we made cooperation with other growers around the farm and that was very important we could produce all the quantity that young living was using already at that time because the, the the need for young living was so big so i had to make uh good deals with other growers but i could control their quality because we would distill together as a co-op and i would know exactly what they were producing and that's how we could uh, develop the production for young living so Sean and Will, with all the, the traits and the knowledge that he took from being in time with you and in France and learning, did he apply all of that knowledge with the farm that he built and constructed in St. Mary's, Idaho? Because from what I remember, he took some lavender from France and started growing it in St. Mary's. Um, do you have any stories or any information you can share on that? Yes. Uh, I remember he was eager to start growing lavender in, in Idaho. And he took the best seeds because we went all the way up to the top of the mountains to get wild lavender seeds, you know, not cultivated seeds. Yeah. So those were the, the best you, you, you could have. He brought them back in his pocket or whatever. And uh, he started uh, cultivating in, in Idaho. We had doubts it would work because the soil in Idaho was so different from the soil we have in France. So we were a little bit worried it wouldn't work. But as a matter of fact, Gary was uh, smart enough to balance the, the soil by bringing in other components that would allow to grow lavender and he was very successful. So, Jean-Noël, after my dad visited France after a while, um, he had heard about a, an issue with the lavender fields, a, a disease that was killing the lavender. What exactly was going on there? Was, what was going on was that at that time we were developing cultivation of cloned lavender instead of uh, just population lavender grown from seeds. Clone lavender is like when you take a, a, a plant and make a starter out of it. You know, you take a little piece of the plant and you replant it. So all the other plants will be exact twins, exact same plant mm -hmm. than the original one. A population lavender will be grown from seeds only. And like a population, each plant is different. But then, when you have huge fields of clone lavender, if one insect will go on one plant of the field, then they will go all over to the same plants that are next to them. And that would kill the field. If they go to a population lavender, the next plant may be stronger than the first one who cut a little bit the... the and that would stop the... Uh, development of this illness. You see what I mean? Yes, it would stop the spread of the disease. And that was a very important point for Gary. You know, he studied that for a long time and he said, the only way we can save the lavender is to grow population lavender from seeds. And that's exact. I'll, then you need to know that growing from seeds gives you a very low yield per acres, for example. Yes. Much lower than cloned lavender that have, that have been selected mostly for their quantity of oil produced per acre. 
but even so, but the quality of population lavender is much better than clone lavender anyway. So even so, the the, the yield was much lower. Gary pushed that we kept cultivating population lavender for him. Other companies, mostly perfume industry, all they were looking for was a good price. And clone lavender was much cheaper than population lavender. The, the, the clone lavender is a much weaker plant. And then when you have an illness coming on the field, it would kill the whole field. With this um, illness that was going around with the lavender, were there any farmers or crops in particular that lost their lavender or that almost lost their lavender? Absolutely. Many farmers lost their lavender and some of them, some of them went uh, bankrupt. Um, with finding out that the population lavender um, helped prevent the spread of the disease. Did you share this information with the other farmers that were struggling with their lavender fields as well? And if so, what was the result from that? Were they able to regrow their lavender? Were they able to have lavender back on their fields? What happened after that? Oh, that was a very important discussions we had with the growers. Uh, first of all, your dad said, I want population lavender oil. The true lavender. lavender oil. So uh, the, the grower said, because they were ready to go for clone lavender since the yield was better, so money was better, and so on. But then when Gary promised he would buy all their population lavender uh, for, for Young Living, they, they would stop growing uh, clone lavender in the mountain. They would still grow it in the valleys, down, you know, in the valleys. But in the mountain area, they would go back to population lavender, when in fact, if they had gone to clone lavender in the mountain, they would have disappeared, because their yield in the mountain was much lower than the yield in the valleys, and they could compete with the valley growers. And that's how, really, Gary saved those growers by uh, making them grow population lavender. And population lavender is known today as the true lavender, correct? Absolutely. And also from an environmental point of view, it's, it's much more important to keep the, the, any plant, and in particular lavender, almost as it was wild, you know? That means, the weak plants will die, but the strong plants will survive. And then they will make more seeds from strong, you know, uh, uh, parents. And that's how we, we keep the biodiversity. And that's important as well, you know, wow. not with clone lavender. You don't do that with clone lavender. Wow. Amazing. And so lavender was brought back to life yet once again in France after the population seed um, discovery was brought to all the growers. And lavender nowadays is is fine, right? There's no issue. The illness is pretty much gone from lavender, right? Um, it, it's getting much better. Yeah, much better. Much better than it used to be uh, 20 years ago. That's for sure. All right, Johnny. Well, we, we've talked about the illness and how lavender was brought back to life in France. And one thing I just want to touch up on really quick is I remember this vision of lavender that my dad shared with you back in the 90s that absolutely seemed ridiculous to you. Um, but now because of that vision, essential oils is, is larger than the perfume industry in, in France and all across the entire world. Would you... Can you touch up on that as well? Oh, yes, I can. And I totally agree. When Gary in the 1990 first came, and at that time, there was no aromatherapy, nowhere. I mean, just a, a little bit through some French doctors. But it was so tiny, you know. I would say 99% of the production of lavender would go to the perfume industry at that time. And when Gary, first of all, started to talk about the potential of using essential oils for health, for, for wellness, you know, 
uh, I had doubts of it, uh, about it. And he said, Jean-Noël, one day you will see that the need of essential oil for aromatherapy will be very, very big, maybe even bigger than the need for the perfume industry. And I didn't believe it, you know, and nobody believed it. And everybody was kind of laughing at him. But in fact, that happened about uh, 15 years after he said so. So he was right once again. Well, Jean-Noël, it has been a long time and an amazing journey throughout these last, what, 30 years with my dad and, you know, 40, 50 plus years for you with Lavender. And um, I really want to thank you for your time being on the podcast with us here and sharing all of your knowledge, your information and your stories. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? Sure. I'm, I'm thinking of your dad, uh, Jacob. He completely changed my vision of lavender in particular and on essential oil. And I was uh, uh, such a challenge, you know, when I first met him. But it has been so rewarding to follow your dad. And working with him for 30 years uh, was a blessing for me. Sir, absolutely. And my whole family. Yes. Well, and thank you for being part of our family and helping us along the way and continuing his legacy. And I, for one, have enjoyed Lavender for as long as I can remember. And we're just extremely fortunate that today with Lavender's beauties and, and that its benefits are so accessible to everyone. And I can't help but thank you for all of your efforts, Jean-Noël, and your son's efforts, Nicholas as well with helping make sure that lavender thrives in its glorious purple form for all of you who have not seen the lavender fields in person in full bloom up close please make sure to put it on your list lastly thank you once again so much john and well for coming on to our show today and talking and sharing your stories and your experiences with the lavender and how lavender was saved and just the whole history behind it thank you all so much for watching this episode don't forget to oil up this is Jacob Young, dropping out. Take care. That was awesome. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> couple of things. Um, when Jean Noel said uh, Gary um, brought lavender seeds home in his pocket, <laughs> we've heard through the years he brought them home in his boot because he couldn't get through. You, It's illegal to carry seeds from one country to another because you can import all kinds of diseases that can destroy the crops in the country you're bringing it into. So he had it in his boot on the way home. That's what we heard. And <laughs> right. we also heard that the story is he provided the seeds from the United States to restart those fields in Provence. So, yeah. so young living saved France by supplying those seeds that they were going to use to, to build with. Um, and Jean Noel has spoken at a couple of conventions and I was there, I, you might've been there that year too, Deborah, when um, he came on stage and he told Gary, the student has become the teacher. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so Gary explored and learned so much on his own that now he was teaching them their own business. So I thought that was amazing. There is a book that Jean Noel wrote. Let me see if I can find it here on Amazon for you. Um, it is just amazing because it um, talks about um, Gary's integrity and his um, 
his honesty and his eagerness to learn and his willingness to work hard. And um, it's just an awesome book to read the history because you're hearing it from a person that worked with him the whole time. Um, not just other people in the industry, in Young Living, that say, um, yes, Gary was an awesome person. Um, I can't find it right off. I typed in his name, but I didn't find it there. Oh, maybe here, maybe we're getting to it. Um, I have it myself. I didn't think to get it out before the then I'm pretty sure I got it on, oh, you know what? I might've gotten it on, um, on um, the reference book place, Life Science LSP. Let's see if it's on there. Yeah, it's called um, D. Gary Young, The Lavender Connection, as told by Jean-Noel Landau. And it's on, um, here, I'll just put the link in the chat here. So you can copy and paste it and save it. But if you go to discoverlsp.com and just type in Landell, L-A-N-D-E-L, the okay. book will pop up so and that's the link to it it's um it's $19 $20 basically 19.95 if you um if you want to use my um login code just reach out to me and i you can use my login code and you can get the member pricing on there and i think free shipping uh, no matter what the how much you order so um you would really enjoy this book if you want to know more of the history of gary and uh, of young living itself so what was your favorite part of the movie Uh, well, I thought it was kind of interesting that it took them 10 years to um, acquire that farm to start to grow in um, France. Yeah, and that was very interesting. And it, it brought to mind for me is that when you have a goal in mind or something that you want to do, um, not to get too anxious about it because it just takes time for it to manifest. That's what exactly. came to my mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Young Living was incorporated in 93. So um, they were starting to grow lavender in uh, St. Mary's, Idaho. And then they found that farm in Mona, Utah. And of course, they grow other things there. They go Melissa and um, <laughs> Goldenrod and that kind of thing there. But yeah, to have that, those farms in France really upped the availability of how much oil we have of lavender. So, and just think now, I mean, you can go in Meyer and find, you know, in the baby section, lavender lotion, uh, <laughs> sleepy bedtime bubble bath with lavender and all that. I'm sure none of that is real lavender it's just synthetic smell of lavender that they've put in that bottle so um very very cool very cool stuff i thought it was cool too that they grew the populated lavender up in the mountains and not in the valley yeah, yeah. so why was that i mean was it better conditions up on the mountain or i don't know um, I, he didn't say why, and I don't no. remember from the book. Um, hmm. 
I think it was something about the climate, but I don't remember exactly. That's yeah. what I wondered because they said if they had grown it in the valleys, it all would have died. Well, if they kept growing the um, the clone, the, the clone, the clone. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it all would have died. Yeah, because yeah. I think the Idaho farm isn't that why we don't have the lavender there because there are other things that grow better in that area. After we, I did my silver trip retreat there, that's what was one of the big things. They started moving, putting other plants in that area. In St. Mary's? Yeah, because we don't have the St. Mary's. Now it's a, a specialty bottle if you have a St. Mary's lavender. Oh, yeah. But they didn't stop growing it there, did they? They just... From what I understand, but I'm not sure because I was, I remember that was one of the things that they were starting to share with us saying that, you know, if something grows better in that climate, then uh -huh. change it out. Could be. So, I mean, they, question. yeah, they aren't above, um, they aren't no, they above can. changing themselves around. So yeah, to making sure it's the best quality and if the environment's better in another plant, they'll move it out. Yeah, right. Yeah. So exactly. I almost want to research that out just to find out because I'm thinking that's what happened. Because I remember it was uh, a big deal when people have a St. Mary's lavender bottle now because it's no longer. Huh. Mm. Uh, let's see. Island Flats, Northern Lines. I'm looking on the website here. Because <laughs> if it is, they don't have it labeled like that anymore. Just yeah. like the idol balsam fir is now grain fir. They have a different. Um, that's because they um, just because they changed. Um, they found out more about the the um, generics of the oil. So okay, they changed well, the name, but it's still grown in Northern Lights. Okay. Um, here, St. Mary's. All right. Well, it's still called Lavender Farm. Okay. Well, maybe I was mistaken. Uh, I'm I'm willing to bow on that one. <laughs> um, botanical source from this farm: Lavender, oh. Melissa, Goldenrod, Blue Spruce. I think it was the, lavender was the main, but they were talking about Melissa and other ones to be added. So yeah. I really assumed that they had, you know, had either gotten rid of it or definitely lessened it. Dif yeah. Def so, um, okay. I know when I was there um, after you, they had Melissa there and talked about how delicate a lady she is. And um, in the goldenrod fields were just gorgeous. We did that on another class, showed the farmer in the goldenrod there. Nice. And of course, blue spruce is these big old trees here, so... Very so cool. yeah, if you just go on the website and do company and then farms, you can find out where they you can find out all the farms. And awesome. um, if you want to visit a farm, uh, well, it used to have maybe you just can't have that one. That's in Mexico, White Swan, Washington. Hmm. At some place, it might be on the um, on the after you log in. I didn't log in. It has the address and phone number of the farm, and you can call them and say, "I'm going to be in your area on September 27th. Can I visit the farm?" And you can visit the farms. So, um, as far as I know, no other company does that no Never. essential oil company and most of them don't even have their own farms so <laughs> right this is um this brand comparison chart is amazing um it has all of these different companies and then across the top it has i'm sorry companies are across the top and then down the side, it says, who's the formulator? How many single oils? How many blend oils do they have? Young Living has 112 blends, probably more now. 
doTERRA has 28 blends. Would so, you, when you email out the link, could you email that one out to that reference? I'd like to get that. I'm sure it's on uh, LSP, right? I sent you a scan of it in the past. Okay. okay. <laughs> I think that's from 31 oils. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. It's from 31oils.com. And I okay. have a scan of it. So Perfect. I can I can attach the scan if you guys want it. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. So I couldn't do so many it. people swear by it. It has to be, it's four pages. So you have to kind of paste it together because it doesn't, this whole thing doesn't scan. It's too big. Right. So yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. But look sure. and see in your files, Deborah. You might have a brand comparison. Well, I'm sure I do. <laughs> <laughs> I know we just have so much. You just you just don't can't remember everything so <laughs> all right guys well it's 750 so yeah. wow that was great fast. class tonight yeah. Kirk, thank you oh you're welcome that was My nice <laughs> i don't even have a sore throat or anything so. <laughs> <laughs> all right it. guys thanks for joining i'll send and the link out in the morning bye, bye now all righty <laughs> good night, bye. Good night.